So um, hopefully now everyone's got the link and the registrations are at 83. And sorry for that short ad lib that we just did then. Um, so again, you're very welcome to getting authorised and being supervised by the Central Bank of Ireland as a payment institution, e-money institution, and virtual uh, or registered as a virtual asset services provider. I'm joined today by Stephen Fletcher. Stephen works uh, in Compley Reg, um, and those of you who aren't aware of Compley Reg, uh, it is a, a regulatory consulting uh, um, uh, business, and we are doing a lot of work in relation to authorizations, not just in Ireland. But also in uh, we've done them in Lithuania, Malta, uh, the UK, um, and there's another interesting jurisdiction coming on board soon. So, um, Stephen, just want to stop there and just um, ask you like to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I, I've been in around the uh, technology finance business for about three decades now. Um, recently, been working with Peter on some of these authorizations in CompliReg and very happy to be here to, to help share the understanding. Thank you very much, Stephen. Now, I'm just going to share the screen here um, and pop up our presentation. And as I do that, um, what, what you should see is hopefully, and Stephen, just let me know, is the presentation showing in full? Yep, all good. Yes, perfect. Okay. And so the other people who will be joining you, Stephen, um, will be uh, Kate from IDA Ireland, uh, who will just talk about uh, the foreign direct investment into Ireland and what they're seeing in financial services and in fintech, interest coming into Ireland. Samantha Sheen, that many of you on the call will know, uh, podcast, uh, um, uh, you know, long-term subject matter expert. I've known Sam for many years through ACAMS, worked with her in many different countries on uh, anti-money laundering uh, presentations and events. Um, she's also former um, EMEA um, for Stripe, MLRO and Financial Crime Compliance Officer. So she's going to come in and do one of these guest presentations about uh, issues that are, are arising um, that people see in their, um, in their regulated businesses. And also Stephen Hall will be popping in. Stephen is a lawyer qualified in Ireland and in the UK and head of the immigration practice for Armstrong uh, Teasdale. Now, um, so you're very welcome, uh, all, all of you. Now, I just want to turn to the next slide. St uh, Stephen Fletcher, you can see that. Can you, the audience and presenters of the uh, um, slide, can you? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, so here's the agenda. Welcome, presentation, subject matter experts at 15.35 after we do the presentation for 30 minutes. And then we'll do 10 minutes with additional Q&As. Thank yous and last words and bring proceedings to a close. We are going to run this very tightly, so we may not be able to get through all the questions that are asked, but there is a chat facility and there's also a QA and a facility, okay? So you can start asking your questions now and one of us will be looking at the questions while the other person is talking and we'll start trying to figure out how we can answer the questions in a group. Um, now, if you just to recap, FinTech Ireland, uh, we set this up uh, back in 2014. We're tracking so many companies now, it's well over 400, getting a lot of rich data from the survey. There's 260. Uh, it's more than 1,900 subscribers to FinTech Ireland. And I think we've got, I think it's 2,400. So thanks for those who come to these events and subscribe. We've got the LinkedIn page, we've got the Twitter handle. We're getting a lot of visits and we're doing a lot of free events um, and all our events are, are free as, as you guys know, no one's paid to come to a FinTech Island event. Now, uh, in, in just setting the context, as you may know, the Central Bank of Ireland regulates in excess of 10,000 financial services companies. Ireland's the third largest exporter of financial services from the European Union. And we have 250 of the world's largest financial services companies with an operation in Ireland, including 50% of the world's top 50 banks and 75% of the top global banks, uh, uh, of the top global 20 banks, I should say. So thank you, IDA Ireland, for all those stats you put out there and also Enterprise Ireland. Thank you to Irish Funds Industry Association. Uh, now looks like 5.38 trillion total of funds are being administered in, um, in Ireland. And what's very interesting when we look at the audience number is how many people are coming along from the funds industry to these events. There's a lot of innovation going on there. 
at least 45,000 people worked directly in international financial services. It was fairly COVID um, resilient. And 7,000, about 15%, work in payments in reg tech, which are the two largest sectors in the market. 105,000 people work, in tech, uh, work as technology sector employees. Again, thank you to my guest presenters. I've already called you out. Um, in today's audience, for, this is, as you've been to, and I've, as I've gone through the registration details, I see a number of folk have been to all three events that we've done in the last month. So thanks very much. You won't be surprised by these figures. Again, it's around about 45% uh, FinTech or RigTech attending and 50, 56% other. So normally 40, 60% splits, somewhere like that. Um, and again, it's financial institutions, IT, cloud computing. Of course, there's a number of firms on the call today that are looking to get licensed. And a number of them are actually involved in e-commerce and probably going for a vertical integration into e-money or into payments or indeed those looking for an e-money license and also wanting to do virtual service account pro, uh, provider licenses are also on the call. And globally, look, this under 50% of us come from Ireland in terms of our global HQ. Um, uh, where our, our, our company is globally HQ, but from overseas, 54%. And this time, the UK has picked the USA for the event. And that's despite us putting this on a more friendly time for the folk in the States. So the UK number one global HQ after uh, Ireland in terms of being here today, USA. Netherlands is very interesting. You're very welcome to the folk from the Netherlands, Israel, and then 2% each from Switzerland, France, Estonia, China, Germany, Spain, Hong Kong, and Luxembourg, and 10% balance from those uh, from the other countries there, including Cyprus. Hello, guys there. Um, uh, Isle of Man, Italy, Pakistan, Portugal, Gibraltar, Australia, um, South Africa, Russia, and the UAE. And you're all more than welcome. Um, when we ask the question about what sector are you uh, interested in today, 56% of you of 195 that registered for the event said that you're interested in all of those sectors, e-money, payments, and virtual account service providers. And 44%, the balance of you said that you were interested in some of them, but not all of them. You've all seen these FinTech maps perhaps in the past. Um, I'm not gonna stop and talk about them. They're just to say, this is one of the reasons why Ireland is attracting uh, a lot of inward FinTech companies because we have a very good indigenous FinTech scene. And this is the indigenous FinTech map that you can see here. We also, and that's the same map split down by a pie chart. Um, all these all this material is available already on our website under the events tab from previous events. So I won't stop and talk about them because some of you have already seen this. But again, what's, in, what's interesting is the amount of the firms in payments is still number one and reg tech number two. Believe it or not, in Ireland, we actually do regulate uh, some reg tech firms under MIFID. This is the international map that Peter O'Halloran uh, helped curate and actually led on curating, I should say, in fairness. Um, and again, what we see here, payments is still very big in terms of international fintech. Now, this is just a breakdown of the map side by side. I'm, I'm not going to stop and talk about it. We've seen this in the past, but there are 357 fintech companies operating in Ireland, either indigenous or have set up operations here and now call it home. We're now getting to the meat of the topic. We are all here today to talk about authorization of electronic money firms and authorization of payment institutions and the registration of virtual uh, account service providers. Those of you who are familiar, and as I said, please, you know, um, of the participants on the call today, start getting your questions in. Um, uh, we may even actually just flip a poll up while I'm talking here, and uh, I might just launch the poll which is um, how long do you think it takes to get from filing stage to authorization? If you'd like to take that poll, it's anonymous. Um, Stephen, I'm gonna ask you, Mr. Fletcher, to come in and talk about those results in a minute. 
What we see in front of us here is what's in the authorization application form. And those of you who are familiar with it, great. We're not going to stop and talk about the form in any great detail. Today is about some of the lessons we're learning and hopefully getting some of your shared experiences as well. So what you'll notice is that the uh, that application form for uh, e-money is an authorization form and it's covered across and there's 11 uh, sorry 18 guidelines there uh, guideline one is not really a guideline it's general principles and then the rest follow i'm going to look at this side by side with the virtual service asset providers regime and also the payment institutions regime but when you look at that slide and you compare it to the next slide the authorization of um, payment institutions is exactly the same level of guidelines that we have to complete. Um, and although that looks rather exhausting, don't forget that in guideline 14, internal control mechanisms, there's actually a big questionnaire. And then in guideline 15, there's all the individual forms for IQ forms that we have, individual questionnaire forms that have to be completed in details underneath that. And of course, in a number of those guidelines, there's a request for seeing policies and procedures. We'll talk about some of those as we go through today. Now, what we just saw was authorization, and I think that's really important to note because now we're talking about registration, which is different than authorization. Now, as you all know, or probably most of you know, in Ireland, we, we don't have any uh, small payment institutions or any small EMIs uh, which are registered. Uh, we, the central bank has only authorized firms, so that's why I'm using authorization for e money and payments. When it comes to firms that just want to be an account information services provider and not have this service, which is number seven, sorry, number eight, um, uh, in the list, of, uh, in the annex and the directive, this is a registration. And you can sort of see that there is some material which is common to the authorization slides, but it is it is lighter. And again, I'm going to go through a comparison here um, in, in just a moment. Now, when you're getting your pack ready, you can't just start with the form. You have to read the guidance note. And one thing I would say is I've always been surprised by the number of folks that haven't read the guidance note before they start the application. And, um, and you know, and, and I think we're all, you, you can all be guilty of this. Um, on this phone call today, um, something like between 35 to, around 35% uh, of the companies or 40% of the companies on this call would fall into what I would say is a professional services firm, which is either a lawyer, an accountant, a recruitment firm, a public relations firm, or some other consultant that is focused on compliance and regulation. So actually doing this today, Compli Reg, you know, we are with you doing the same work that you're doing in that group. Um, and, and what we would say is it's great if we could all share these experiences. But I think even a lot of you out there, because I do, do know a lot of the other consultants, where they were also surprised by the fact that not many people go through and read the guidance notes, which are incredibly important. And as we know from the central bank, you are reminded of these the, the day that you get through the key information deck. If you're not if you're not reminded of this before you actually file, even at your initial meeting with the central bank. But again. Very important to note these documents and be familiar with them. The virtual account asset services provider um, uh, um, form is also on the website now or a sample of what is going to be there. And I'm just going to finish these slides very quickly before I turn to Stephen. Going back to the central bank's website and today it still says it's written in the future tense. Once the law is passed, this will be the regime. Well, at the moment, from what I see is the legislation was signed into place in 18 March 2021, so just recently, um, and it also appears on the President's website. So this law is now number three of 2021, and now that this law has taken effect, it applies to exchanges between an exchange between a virtual asset and a fiat currency, an exchange between one or more forms of virtual assets, the transfer of virtual assets, to conduct a transaction on behalf of another person that moves a virtual asset from one virtual asset address or account to another, a custodian wallet provider, and participation in or provision of financial services related to an issuer's offer or sale of a virtual asset or both. I think there's a lot of work for us lawyers out there in the next number of months. Um, but that is the definition from the legislation. 
But if you're already involved in providing virtual asset services in Ireland, you may be able to avail of what's called the transition um, provision under Section 106F, which is all about um, those carrying on the business immediately before the law came into place. And you are taken to be registered to carry on your business so you can continue your business until such time as the bank has granted or refused your application. So I'm going to stop. Um, there at the moment. Uh, sorry, I might just start. Uh, I'll just stop on this slide. Sorry, I'll fix this slide. This is actually slide four and four. Um, when we are, when you are getting ready for a virtual asset service provider application, just note this slide here. Like EMI and payment institutions, it feels that the central bank and many other regulators look at us through the prism of financial crime. So there is some fitness and probity requirements here, but it's all very much looking at us through the prism of financial crime, including having our policies and procedures up to date and our risk assessments done. Stephen, I'm going to end the polling and I'm going to share the results. And the results are, uh, so the question is, how long do you think it takes to get from filing stage to authorization? Yeah, very interesting. So, uh, yeah, so according to the polls, 2% of you think that it could be done in less than three months. 13% between three and six months. 32% would say between six and nine months. And 53% would say plus nine months. Yeah. So I guess, Stephen, it depends on the level of preparation. It's not so much, I guess, from the filing stage, but how much work you put into the application before you submit it to the central bank at the key information check stage. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right, Peter. I mean, I, I think the the fact that a lot of people that have been through this realise that, you know, yes, the, the central bank set a 90-day clock for the, the process of reviewing the application, but a lot of the effort is back on the submitter side because there's no way will you ever be in a situation where you're submitting a perfect application pack from the beginning there will still be a lot of things that you need to clarify along the way and often that takes a lot of time so you know policies are still getting formed uh people are still getting recruited the organization chart is, is getting fleshed out um and all of these things are taking place in parallel so you know for, for sure the um you know to, towards the end of the scale is more realistic for most people for most organizations that's uh that's excellent thank you very much for that Stephen. um i mean i think you know less than three months three to six months many you know a while ago we were hearing people sort of saying certain jurisdictions are far longer than other jurisdictions um you know i don't know about you but my experience now is that i think with the eba making sure there's no regulatory arbitrage um, even debates about in-country presence of the management team mm -hmm. now seems that a number of jurisdictions which may not have actually set out at their initial meeting with an applicant that you had to have the resources in-country are now saying that. So it, it does seem that the propensity for regulatory arbitrage is, dis is, is disappearing. And also a number of the jurisdictions that did, uh, did come out of the gates very quickly after the Brexit, um, I'm talking to them and lawyers and actually the regulators in those jurisdictions, and they've actually said, whatever you do, don't promise anybody that you can get them through an authorization in our jurisdiction in less than six months. That is just not happening anymore and, and, and arguably never actually did. But I'm sure some firms are getting through in a very short time frame. But that's an interesting observation, do you think, about the regulatory arbitrage being looked at by the EBA and sort of a smoothing of that across Europe? I, I think it is. Um, but what I would also say is that for uh, some of the applicants, they feel like it should be really quick because they, they already have all of their documents in place from another, another jurisdiction. Well, that's only part of the story. And as, as you alluded to, uh, Peter, I mean, you've really got to satisfy the regulator that you're here in Ireland. So having uh, all of the right documentation is only part of it. You've actually got to show the substance. Um, and I think the... Um, the central bank certainly would take note that you're registered in by the FCA or or in um, other markets, but it's not going to really shortcut their 
satisfaction that you are ready to be licensed. No, thanks for that, Stephen. I uh, thoroughly agree with you. What I've just put up on the screen now, and hopefully you can see it, is I, I've done a read across um, the authorization and registration um, guidelines for EMI firms, APIs, and account information services providers. And I've compared it to what's sitting there on the central bank's website and in that Excel spreadsheet on their website, which is a, um, a guide at the moment. Um, and trying to figure out, well, if I was going for a virtual account service provider license, yeah, you know, sometimes I could be doing that because I'm also going to provide an e-wallet. So I'm going to have a fiat wallet and also a crypto wallet. So I'm going to need both an authorization now and, and maybe the registration as well. So I thought what would be useful here is just to have a look and say, well, if we look at the general principles, that area is common across EMI, APIs and account information services providers. And it's all the way down to the structural organization, which is guideline five. That's common through the first three. The virtual account service providers don't have their regime set out yet for the registration. But when I've looked through what's being requested, it looks to me that actually a mini form of a program of operations, and if not a full blown business plan, and if not um, a, um, uh, obviously the identification details, but a program of operations and a business plan is going to be required. But in my view, the business plan and the program of operations three and four are actually the engine room of an application. If you don't get that right, nothing else really works. Any thoughts on that? No, that's right. I mean, you know, it's, when you're putting together an application, you've absolutely got to get those right first. You know, that, that is where you're explaining what the business is there for, uh, how it will operate until you get that right. The central bank really wouldn't know what questions to ask about how, how you're going to run the business, what safety precautions are you going to take. Um, so I think those, those areas are fundamental and I'm sure that they will be included. Yeah, and I, I'm sort of thinking that in the program of operations, you end up setting up your payment services. And why I'm mentioning that is because if you do apply for a, a license or an authorization as an electronic money institution in Ireland, Central Bank will only provide that to you where you also elect the payment service that you're also going to provide. They have a view, and this is my understanding from working on applications, that you can't have, if you're going to have an EMI license, you have to have a payment, slide, a payment service attached to it. So then it means figuring out, is it enabling cash to be deposited, a cash to be withdrawn, one and two? Is it uh, offering a payment account, um, um, payment and, and, and execution of a transaction with a, with, with or without a credit line, three and four? Five, is it merchant acquiring mm. or issuing a payment instrument? Number six, is that money remittance? Number seven, is it a, a payment initiation service? Uh, or is it simply number eight and it's an account information uh, service? So if I look through the rest of these guidelines, you can sort of see in the table where I think they get those points will also be covered by the registration provisions for the virtual account, the virtual asset service providers. Um, on the next slide, I've continued with the guideline number. When I look uh, at the content, so business continuity arrangements, you're going to find them in guideline 19 for e money, for accounting, for um, APIs, and also in guideline 9, though, for account information services providers. But I think you can sort of see where there is no guideline for an account information services provider. So there is no, gui there is no guideline for principles and definitions, for example. Um, and there isn't anything for BASPs in that area. But I want to be very careful to saying there won't be something because we haven't seen the final registration system. But one thing we're absolutely positive of, given what's on the central bank's website, is that the internal control mechanisms to comply with obligations in relation to money laundering and terrorist financing, Stephen, is uh, well and truly covered. Um, we're going to bring Sam on actually to talk about that a little bit later today. Um, but also, what's common is don't don't think that the virtual account um, service provider, virtual asset service provider, I keep saying virtual account, it's getting involved with all these virtual cards and IBANs. But virtual account service providers are also obviously going to be subject to uh, if, uh, details around fitness and probity of the management team, and then also. Uh, the, the UBOs, so to speak, which we have in the other regimes as well. Um, so I, I just thought I'd just cover those off. But um, Stephen, just in relation, I think maybe we might just address it now. 
one of the questions often asked is, well, if I want to go for a license or an authorization as an e-money firm or, an, or a, um, uh, an authorized payment institution is, what's the minimum number of headcount or control functions I have to show, the pre, pre-approved control functions, I should say, I need to show to the central bank. Mm-hmm. And when you read through the guidance note, obviously there's talk about the senior management team and the senior manager, whether it's the CEO or the or the general manager by another name, but a PCF8. Mm-hmm. There's also a chief operation officer, PCF42, but there's also those requirements for the CRO, PCF14, um, the uh, the chief financial officer, PCF11. And um, in addition to the CRO role, uh, depending upon your business model, nature, scale, and complexity, uh, you'll also need a PCF 12 and maybe a PCF 15, depending upon how busy your business gets. Mm. Um, but in that area, it's one of the com- most common questions is how many people do I need to have on the ground? Is, is there a simple answer to that, Stephen? I don't think there is. Um, so, you know, certainly what you need to demonstrate to the central bank is that, um, you know, each person that is taking on that role, because bear in mind that one person can have several of those PCF roles, uh, providing that they are independently qualified to do those roles in isolation, meaning that if you try to get, um, say, the CEO to also where the role of the CFO, he's got to be qualified to do that as well. Yeah. It's not that he's just responsible for it, therefore he can do it. He must be able to pass through the fitness probity for that role. So I think the um, as long as you are demonstrating the fact that there is enough dual control um, and there is enough experience across the team and um, so certainly the areas of risk management and, and sort of um, MLRO are, are definitely a sensitive area because you can't really club too many of these roles together and, and justify the fact that you've got that independence. Yeah. So and I think sure. it does depend on, on your yeah. actual sort of the nature of the business. Um, and, you know, you've just got to start, I guess, as small as you can and work with the central bank on what they feel happy with in your situation because they will tell you for sure. Yeah, uh, but we've seen, you know, we're, I mean, a lot of folks on the, on, on the video call here today, they've all been involved, a lot of them have been involved in applications, so they've had those discussions with the central bank, including some of the tougher discussions where the CBI has just supplanted your commercial view with their regulatory view on your resources. Um, I just want to say thanks to Garrett. Uh, uh, Garrett Cassidy just said, look, hey, guys, just to note that while the central bank don't register small PIs, he says that they will allow registration of a small EMI. They just haven't registered any, and we'll just see that as absolutely the case in just a minute. Um, service levels. These are always a good thing to read because we're often asked um, uh, about, you know, what's in the pipeline. And the central bank may sometimes talk to some of the trade associations or trade bodies and others. There's no general information about this unless you go to the service level standards. But I think without trying to interpret this, I'm just going to put this slide up. And I've just put down the numbers since uh, the start of 2019 to the end of 2020 with what appears to be the pipeline. You you can't just read this by itself. You do need to look at the number of registrations to form a complete picture. But they certainly did go through a lot more acknowledgements and key information check um, uh, processes in H2 2020. So do have a look at those documents. Um, so who's registered in Ireland and who's not? Oh, sorry, who's registered in Ireland? Well, we have 17 approved EMIs. Now, I use the run date here because the run date means the date that appears on the central bank's, regist- uh, on central bank's website on the PDF form. So 17 approved um, electronic money institutions. No credit unions approved to issue e-money, but there is a register up there. There's no no one on the, as Garrett was pointing out, there's no EMIs, re, there's no registered EMIs, but there is a register for them and it shows zero. Um, in terms of payment institutions, there are 21 payment institutions approved, but also interestingly, 20, 224 credit unions are approved to provide a payment service. And we have three account information services, service providers that are registered. 
So I'll let those numbers speak for themselves. This is another way to look at it. This is the map that we put out, which tracks them. And uh, there's a few new ones here. Um, uh, I, I do notice that someone's on the register for payment institutions, but are also shown as being withdrawn. So that's why my number here is 20 versus the central bank's number of 21. Uh, oops, sorry about that. Um, just on the next thing, I'm just going to see, we don't have that many questions coming at the moment, guys. So please don't feel that uh, any questions are silly question. We're more than happy to take it. We've still got 30 minutes to go. We are roaring through this, um, this presentation. Um, but we are happy to take the questions, so do send them in. Um, Stephen, um, we've spoken about the authorization process there and the registration process. I, I, I think you know one of the things that can always be a challenge is you know you have your business area that knows how to run a business, an e-money firm or a payments firm, or it could be a, a group of people very involved in that industry from an information technology perspective, and they've been providing technology to some of these companies, and now they want to step up into that area. Or they could be an e-commerce company, which we've seen a lot of, now saying, hang on, we don't, we, we were selling goods and services, now we want a piece of that value of the transaction when it goes through. So they're looking to get a payments license or an EMI license. Um, but I often find, and I don't know whether it's your view as well, you know, in this preparation, it really is not just regulatory compliance leading the application. It's the business, right? Explaining what's going on. And then could you maybe talk about the importance of the, this new chief information officer that some firms will need to consider, the PCF 49? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, generally uh, what I would say to, to, uh, to this point is that, you know, a lot of businesses start off with a great technology idea and they want to move into the payments world because it's a great place to be. This is the area they've really got to invest in, in the whole understanding the AML, because if they get that wrong, they're screwed. You know, it's, it's an area that we're really just, you know, they, they have got to invest the time to, to do this right. Otherwise, nothing else in their business model really matters. Um, the, the recent introduction of the, um, uh, the, the CIO role, I think, is really recognising the fact that, you know, we are in a very technology area, technology driven area. It's not just, you know, understanding purely the, the um, you know, the, the stakeholders in a payment chain. It's understanding the importance of ensuring the protection of the information, ensuring the reporting of the information. Um, ensuring adherence to all of the, um, the, the policies. Uh, so the, the CIO role really comes into its own uh, because they have focus over and above just keeping the, uh, the, the lights on, as it were. You know, it, that, it's... That's perfect. Thanks for that, Stephen. I mean, look, I guess the point really being after we look at all these things is that... Um, you know, you, you need you, you need the financial officer to be involved with guideline four because you've got to put in very detailed Excel spreadsheets. And not only are they detailed as in the business model today, central bank will ask you to do stress tests on them in, in relation to COVID or other hiccups and maybe show them with a 20% decrease or a 40% decrease or other impact. And then looking to see how those calculations end up with the requirement for you to maybe potentially need more capital. And then we, and I think, I think, thanks for this, the, the comments around technology, because I mean, when you get to guideline sort of 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, you need that sort of level of expertise. And on some very complicated applications, we've even had to call in separate IT experts that could actually try and comprehend what the firm wants to do. Give that to us in a language that we also understand in terms of regulation, even though we've got a, you know, and a lot of folk out there have great IT backgrounds, but to, to pull that whole picture together. So um, I thought what I'd just say here is I'm about to start calling in some of the panel, the guest pop-up speakers. Um,
areas for supervision, because we did say that this event was not just discussing authorizations, right, and, and some of the things you need to think about, but also ongoing supervision. And I do think it is fair to say that a lot of us feel that across Europe, we've been looked at in through the prism of only financial crime with not that much conduct of business rules examination by regulators. Now, that may not necessarily be correct in every case. So trying to think about, Stephen, in terms of areas for inspection, we, we, cobbled, we cobbled these together. We thought, well, obviously, AML, because that's the prism through which we looked at. And, and um, obviously, the analysis of the money laundering prevention requirements. And the central bank will pick up its comfort level on this through guideline 14 and the questionnaire that firms have to complete. And by the way, if you are completing guideline 14 and the and Excel spreadsheet, make sure your math works. The central bank will go through that and pick up anomalies where on in one section you say something which contradicts another section. Particularly, um, that happens now even at the key information check stage. So again, maybe it's not worth sending anything into the central bank until you're pretty much sure that your application is for all intents and purposes complete, notwithstanding there's still the assessment phase to go through. But I think, Stephen, this analysis of money laundering requirements, you know, looking at Wirecard, looking at some of the issues in other countries, the question about fund segregation and safeguarding, um, and we touched on the CFO role, the client funds accounting procedure. Another one we're seeing in certain jurisdictions is the enforcement actions taken where capital calculations are incorrect. We saw one in the UK recently where somebody was treating the payment institution like it was a bank and holding on to people's money forever and a day. And that's not to be the case with that license. Um, compliance with other obligations, whether it's the Criminal Justice Act across the board, CBI acts. Um, fitness and probity, and we've all saw the letters in November last year from the Central Bank on that. Uh, reliability of internal controls and management systems, outsourcing, obviously a critical one when we get to guideline five in an application. You know, not just material, but also non-material outsourcing. And it doesn't matter that it's external or within the group. Of course, we have an industry thematic business, but the one I thought, Stephen, is interesting is you made this point, don't forget all the undertakings you made in your application because you signed off on that, that it's, it's true and correct. Well, absolutely. And, and even at the very stage where you're putting it together, I think one, one thing that we do see is that a lot of people assume the, uh, the outsourcing is probably their main application. What is the main platform they use to serve their customers? But actually, when the central bank look at this, they're looking at everything that you outsource because any one component that is not managed properly is not um, properly secure um, could impact your ability to serve your customer with a knock-on effect yeah. so the ability right up up front to be able to define what you're outsourcing what are your minimum requirements when you're outsourcing and to articulate those properly and consistently throughout the guidelines is really key and as you're right, you're very right, Peter, you know, six months down the road, you better still be doing what you said in the guidelines. Um, otherwise, you will fall foul. You know, you've got to, if you make a significant change, the regulator really needs to, to look at that yeah. um, to say, yeah, that's OK. And sorry, Stephen, there's a couple of AML questions that have just come in. Um, mm -hmm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save it until Sam jumps up uh, or jumps yeah. on the call. But what I'm going to do actually is, sorry, Sam. I'm going to hold you back for a minute. I'm going to call Kate up. Kate, are you are you out there in cyberspace? Kate, could you turn your video on and microphone on? Um, apologies, I didn't see that you're in the room until just a few minutes ago, and I would have called you in slightly earlier, a few minutes ago, just to talk about the attractiveness of Ireland in financial services. Maybe some of the things that you're seeing in terms of firms that are approaching you about the sort of why Ireland and anything that you might be able to share with the audience over the next three to five minutes. Sure, yes. Um, oh, hi, hi, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> I didn't introduce you properly. Kate from IDA <laughs> Ireland. No problem. Vice President, Financial Services Europe. Over to you. Great, thanks, Peter. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, many thanks for, for today's discussion so far to date, um, and to Peter and to Stephen for, for your insights. 
Um, I suppose for, for those that, who might not necessarily know IDA Ireland, we are um, an Irish government agency responsible for uh, promoting Ireland as a location for international business. Um, we currently have about um, 1,600 companies uh, in our client portfolio and we work across a number of different sectors, including financial services. Um, and as Peter man mentioned um, at the beginning, I, I am part of the financial services team. Uh, I'm based in Paris uh, and I cover our European portfolio. Uh, so I manage our client relationships with um, European headquartered companies operating across uh, a number of financial services sectors. So in, in terms of kind of how we specifically assist uh, client companies, companies come to us at, uh, at various stages of their journey. Some are only looking around and looking at various jurisdictions, uh, some of the jurisdictions that were mentioned earlier by Stephen and by Peter. Um, others have already heard about Ireland, um, have heard about Ireland either for, for fintech or for payments, uh, for technology uh, a lot of the time and want to simply find out what the buzz is all about at the moment. Um, and then others are, are quite advanced in their plans. Um, and know exactly what they want, uh, in which case they usually tell us that they wish they had met us two or three years earlier in their journey as we would have made the process much simpler for them. Specifically, how do we help uh, client companies? We have a variety of, of hard and soft supports. Um, uh, and essentially the idea of the supports is to plug in uh, a company into the Irish ecosystem as much as possible. And that's applicable to both newcomers those that are not familiar um, with Ireland as a jurisdiction, but also very useful to a lot of the established companies that are in Ireland a number of years and maybe even have Irish management teams um, because it gives them an understanding um, it enables them to take a, a step back and give an understand, get an understanding, get, um, get a view of what's happening in the wider ecosystem. And I think that's where we provide quite a, quite a significant competitive advantage in that we are, as a government agency, we have a good overview of what's happening across a number of clusters and companies. Um, networking too though, isn't it? Like if someone coming into one or looking at it, an e-money firm wanting to set up here, yeah. you could introduce them to a network of someone else you've brought in just so they can get the lay of the land and they can hear that direct. I mean, that if, you, if, you, if you've got that sort of soft um, networking um, um, uh, process as well, haven't you? Absolutely, Peter. Yeah, so that's probably one of the most essential starting points for anybody coming in at where, you know, they don't even know where to start. And uh, that's where specific introductions that we provide, whether it be to the government system, uh, to peer companies across a number of, of different industries, not industries, not necessarily within financial services, but uh, as I said, we, we operate ac across various uh, different sectors, including technology, life sciences, you know, medical devices. Um, and it's very relevant for companies, particularly who are looking to scale outside of the traditional financial services uh, specialisms. So we also facilitate introductions to the, the central bank. And I know that's quite relevant to the audience uh, here today, as well as, as legal providers and so on. Um, I think critically as well um, for, for companies that are looking strategically at Ireland and trying to understand how they can develop innovation, how they can, you know, set up initiatives where they, can, they get to really tap into the, the unique talent pool that we have. For example, maybe look at research and development. We also provide a number of harder supports uh, that look at, you know, incentives um, and funding programs that right. enable companies to look at opportunities that, that are a little bit more strategic to the wider group. Uh, but as you said, absolutely, we are, we are connected with the, you know, the, the clusters uh, across all of Ireland. Um, and it is very useful to somebody who is who's brand new, who's just landed um, and want to want to get a sense of, of the landscape and what Ireland has to offer. And that's been excellent. Thanks for that, Kate. And just very quickly, what I was going to say is that although this is about electronic money payment institutions and virtual, ser virtual account service providers, there's actually a few companies on the call today that I know are looking for a muted license. I'm just wondering, are you sort of also seeing in the fintech space, not just electronic money in the payments where we're doing really well in Ireland, are you seeing mm. interest, you know, from the funds area on the tech side or banking on the tech side or other areas of regulated financial technology that Ireland might, might end up attracting? 
Absolutely, Peter. Yes. And that's it's something that that's applicable across all of the financial services um, sectors that I work with, both in banking, insurance and, as you mentioned, funds. Um, so it's, it's something that companies are uh, exploring uh, beyond the regulatory stage. So we see a lot of them, I suppose, in the initial stages, maybe looking at, you know, developing um, regulatory presence. So whether through securing an authorization with the Central Bank of Ireland and, you know, establishing um, a key presence of a number of senior executives who then, you know, as they, they get a sense of what Ireland is like and all the advantages from the perspective of how easy it is to do business, how easy it is to uh, have access to the European market, uh, how uh, many, you know, the type of talent pool that they can, um, th that they can tap into, how um, collaborative uh, the wider ecosystem is, and they look to see and explore the various opportunities in technology. So that's where um, introductions to the likes of research centres who uh, might provide, you know, a particular insight in, into a new technology that a business is looking to adapt and do a, a trial case or a pilot case uh, with a client. And that works really well because they see the opportunity to scale that at a, at a wider level. Um, so for sure, um, it's something that we can also uh, facilitate and we see quite a trend um, in this area. Oh, perfect, Kate, so I'm gonna say thanks. Um, I'm gonna bring in our next guest speaker as well. Uh, I know you're on LinkedIn and your details are on the IDA's website. So if someone wants to reach out to you, they'll, they'll know where to find you. But I just wanna say thanks for, for, for joining us today. Absolutely, pleasure. <coughs> thanks, Peter. Um, uh, Stephen, um, Stephen Hall, you're out there. So I think this, um, I, I, know if Sam, I know Sam's out there. Really Sam to the end. Um, Stephen, I just think this, there was a really good discussion then with Kate. I just wanted you to maybe come in and just share some thoughts in relation to the employment law issues because, you know, as we see, there's a lot of companies coming in and I've got, a, I've got a couple of emails in yesterday just saying, is it a big deal to bring staff in from overseas? Um, is Ireland got a good immigration system or is it only really preferential to me if I have my staff in the UK and I want to bring them in? Let's not go into COVID and all that, you know, it's too difficult. But maybe just in a, in a give yourself yeah. three minutes just to sort of explore that. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, just following on from, from Kate, a, a very good starting point for anything to do with bringing uh, employees into, the, into Ireland is probably to speak to the IDA. So they're, they're, always, a good, they're always a good place to start. Um, so, and then what, once, you, once you've decided that Ireland is the place you want, want to come to, um, the, immigration the immigration system in Ireland at the moment uh, is probably one of the best because you've got, you, you've obviously got free movement with the, with the EU, so that, that's still in place, but also you've got free movement in a, in a different form with the UK. So Ireland and the UK have got a, a common travel area. So Ireland at the moment is very unique in that UK nationals and European nationals can all work um, in, in Ireland visa-free. So, so that, 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 that's a great advantage. Um, if, if you're coming from, I, I know there's quite a lot of, uh, I think you said there's 20% from the US uh, at the moment. If you're headquartered in the, in the US and you're thinking of opening up an office in Ireland, uh, then the, the immigration system, um, again, is, is very welcoming. So you, as, as long as the, the, the individuals that you're, you're bringing in are sufficiently skilled, um, and uh, so for a general work permit, you're looking at about £30,000, um, although you would have, yeah, sorry, 30,000 euros, sorry, um, although for... Yeah. Uh, for for inter intercompany transfers, so so if you if you've been working in the US company for at least six months, um, then you can come in, um, and that is for, that's forty thousand euros. So I think I think that's quite a reasonable there are reasonable salary figures, um, and that that does pull in quite a lot of skilled people. Um, so uh, something to think about as well is that if you if you are thinking of bringing in uh, foreign nationals, say from the US or outside of the EU, um, then try and make sure that you've got them uh, already working for the overseas entity for six months, because that, that's sort of a key thing. So they've been working for six months, it's easy to yep. bring them in under an intercompany transfer. Right. Whereas if you have to go down the general work permit, then you'd have to justify why you couldn't give the job to a local person, like the resident labor market. And because Ireland's got such... Um, good sort of internal talent uh, a lot of the times it's, it's, it's difficult to justify that so I would say that you know UK nationals don't need a visa um, obviously European nationals don't and also US nationals if they've been working 
uh, for the US entity for six months, the intercompany transfer visa is quite is quite easy to do. So um, I don't think the uh, the immigration system in Ireland should should put any company off um, if you start early enough. Um, it, 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 is, it is quite generous um, from from an, yeah, and from from an employment law perspective, um, it's very similar to the UK. So in the sense that um, there's usually a, you need an employment contract with the Irish entity, um, and all the, all the clauses are quite similar. I would say Ireland is probably more in, um, it's probably more in favour of the employee. So that's maybe something that you want to. Uh, your HR. If you're if you're coming into Ireland, you may want to train up your HR staff uh, because there's a lot of protection for employees, which which I think is a good thing. But it's just something to be aware of. So, um, for instance, in the UK, um, you need two years service before you can bring an unfair dismissal claim. Where in, where in Ireland, it's only it's only one year. Um, and also, in Ireland, you've got the so the working time regulations. Most in uh, in the UK, most people opt out of that, so that so they work more than 40 hour, 48 hours a week if they if they oh. wish. Or, whereas in Ireland, that's a little bit more. Um, I think in, employees uh, don't really opt out of that as much. So um, it's it's just it's just something to think about. I think that the 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 Irish immigration system is very good, very welcoming, um, and especially if, if you speak to ID ID A quite early on, a lot of times they can write you a letter as well, yep. and they, they can they can provide support. Say we've spoken to this company, um, they're a bona fide company, and things like getting getting registered with the revenue, uh, getting a payroll, get uh, getting everything set up really helps in, in the long run with when, when you go to the immigration authorities because you look like you know in, in the same way when you go to the, the central bank the more the more that you've got set up the um the better really uh, but but overall i think ireland's in a really good place visa wise and unemployment wise thank you very much Stephen. i'm not going to throw any more questions at you because we did have a chat about what we covered today and i think that's been really interesting I mean, we probably need a lot more time than we gave for an hour today and, and maybe uh, together with yourself and maybe with Kate and a few others, we might come back and have a look at something around the PCF control functions and also immigration because I yeah. can see some comments coming into my email if we cover that. So can I just say thanks to you, Stephen Hall, Stephen, um, Head of Immigration Practice at um, Strong Teasdale there in the UK, Irish and uh, Irish, I was going to say Irish and Australian qualified, that's me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Irish and Irish and UK qualified. You're very, okay. very good. Thank you, Stephen, for your time. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, I, I see that uh, uh, Sam, you've just joined us uh, here now, which is great. Um, can you hear us, Sam? I can hear you just fine. Sam, I might just in the next couple, I might just keep it to about sort of three or four minutes, just a br brief chat. I mean, the reason is we just covered off this topic of AML. That it could be an area of inspection. Got someone in the questions also asking a, a, a query about AML. Are there any areas relating to AML or anti-fraud service provisions where the CBI has shown a distinct aversion to having outsourced outsourcing those functions. But I just thought generally, so thanks for that question, Michael, from uh, Galliance Alliance. I just thought, hey, with your experience, uh, what do the fintechs need to think about when it comes to financial crime? And not just inward looking, but if they're leveraging the bank services of banks for accounts and all the rest. Do they have another regulator on the doorstep without realizing it? Right. Well, I, I'd say it's still a really big challenging time for fintechs, right? Last month, we had the EBA opinion assessing risk across Europe, and sadly, fintechs are still being pointed out as not really being effective with their financial crime compliance programs. So anybody applying for authorization or licensing should understand you are starting from that context. You've got an uphill challenge, which you can overcome by producing a sensible, logical compliance program that suits your business. And the key is to show that you get what the risks are going to be like to your business. So there is no magical template of policies and procedures that either you, Peter, or myself have hidden in our back pocket. This is very much about for fintechs really showing their banking partners, the regulators, even the FIUs, they get not only the importance of fighting financial crime, but they've got a system they think will work for them. That's really interesting because if you look at Ireland, I mean, there's a lot of debate around the time we did the national risk assessment, a lot of arguments from payments and e-money firms. I think maybe overall, I could be wrong, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the industry, I think they got comfortable where they landed up on the risk assessment. Um, but is, are they being treated fairly the same way in Ireland in that 
impact or risk category as they are in other European countries, do you think, Sam? I, I think they're under closer scrutiny in some respects in Ireland, but in a good way, which is the CBI is really conscious that, you know, as a jurisdiction, it's worked extremely hard to have a solid reputation uh, in terms of its AML regulatory environment. Um, but it still does struggle in some respects with trying to get its messaging across. And, you know, you saw that Dear CEO letter, which I would encourage anybody to go find from last December, where it's really trying hard to signal and tell firms, look, this is where you're not quite getting your programs right. Now, that's a gift in my mind compared to other regulators. In some of the European jurisdictions, they won't tell you what's wrong until you get it wrong. So in some ways, that's a real gift in Ireland is you get that feedback and you get other feedback from the CBI as well, like the transaction monitoring bulletin from last September, really signaling what firms need to do, particularly fintechs around how they monitor transactions and the controls they use. So yeah, closer scrutiny for sure, but there's a lot more sharing of information here. Sam, this has been great. I'm going to just cut us here and I'm going to jump into wrapping it up with the last five minutes. But um. First, I wanted to say, look, thanks, because, I mean, I've known you for many years through ACAMS. We've spoken at events together. You've interrogated me uh, late night in bars. That's going to be read, misread by somebody or misheard <laughs> by somebody. Uh, you give me a hard time, and, uh, uh, and and quite rightly, so thank you. Um, but you're back with Andy. Great job there. I know you're with Stripe, and you're doing the MLRO with EMEA and also head of financial crime. But, hey, look, plug for you, uh, folk. Tune in to Sam. Um, on Captivated Audience. It's a really great podcast. And Sam, I could be leveraging you one day to say, could you run podcast for FinTech Island? Um, could I say thanks? Do stick around in the background. But, you know, many thanks, Sam. And I, we want to we want to have you back again. It's such an incredibly important area. We didn't get through all the questions on AML. Uh, so we sort of then touched on the fitness and probity. There's a couple of questions came in around capital calculations and safeguarding. Look, they are incredibly important areas for the central bank. Don't have anything public to share on that, but I will talk to some of the folk who are asking questions around this. Uh, Nick, I see your questions there for AML and also consumer protection code. Um, Stephen, what I was gonna say is obviously, um, you know, we'd be delighted obviously at CompliReg, you know, to assist firms in this whole area. But, you know, we have put out these guides. I have a blog ready for you to go out uh, later this week, but we do have the guides up, folks, for those that want to sit down and have a little bit more look at what's happening. And instead of just reading through the central bank material, we have put these authorization guidelines up um, on, on the website at FinTech Island under FinTech authorizations. We'll update it a little bit because one or two of the graphs have changed, but nothing in substance has changed there, particularly around the mind and management aspects. What I will say, just as we're about to wrap up, I'm just flipping through some slides here, is that um, don't worry about these slides here. Um, this information from some of the surveys we've been done, particularly where companies are going to um, uh, scale to. But this is what I think is interesting. Some of the challenges for Irish fintechs. Stephen mentioned the issue of, um, of, of employment. Yeah, look, 55% of the firms that did the survey say that retaining and finding talent is a, is, is a, is a challenge. And even in terms of the authorization, what I thought was interesting that not many firms, actually only 13% said getting authorized or registered was a challenge. But when you look at those who did the survey, the vast majority of them don't require an authorization. And when I look at those that do require an authorization and have started it, it's actually 85% of them say it's a challenge. Um, we got some upcoming events before I just come back to Stephen. What I just pull out here is, um, New Jersey event, um, choose New Jersey event with FinTech Island. It's a FinTech bridge and it's there on the 14th of April. You can download the details and see the details on the website. Do have a look at those. Um, we are going to be holding more webs, uh, webinars. If you've got an idea coming of a webinar out of this event, do let us know. Stephen, um, all our details are there, um, et cetera. But what I thought I'd just do is I might just finish up with a slide again about the ongoing supervision, and maybe just one or two final words from you about what's your top three tips to somebody that would just approach you and say, Stephen, what do I need to do to get through the authorization process?
Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter. I, I think um, my, my top tips would be, first of all, make sure you're very, very clear on what the central bank is expecting. Uh, read through that, uh, the, the guidance notes, and understand that it's quite a big application. Um, you know, my, my second tip would be talk to people that have been through that before. Um, use companies that will help you through the process. Company reg, of course, that's what we do, um, because I think it, it's going to save you a lot of time um, in terms of getting it right, getting it through the process, because we, we have a wealth of knowledge that can help add value and don't scrimp, just, you know, get it right and you'll get through the process much, much quicker than trying to, uh, to, to do it yourself. And I, I would definitely say, you know, often one firm or consultant can't do everything for a client. So there may be times where you need additional expertise, um, I, information technology, cybersecurity, depending upon the nature, scale and complexity, you may need help because you want to outsource PCF 13. There's some very good firms out there that will provide that as an outsourced service and will save you time and money on employing someone. And we're now seeing the same service, albeit not as an outsource function, but as a support function for the PCF 11. And it's always been there for the PCF 14. So I think without further ado, I do want to kick this off at four o'clock. It is now two minutes past four. Get in contact with us if you wish. Um, you know, we're pretty open. You've seen a lot of the webinars that we've done, folk. Uh, this one is branded with Pompley Reg. So obviously there's a little bit more of a flavor to it uh, in terms of um, some business. But look, you know, we are very approachable, happy to help. And I just say, look, you know, amongst all of you out there, make sure you network with others in your industry because that's the, one of the best ways to learn on, on these topics. So we hope you've enjoyed the session. Sorry we couldn't get through all the questions. Have an idea now for something else. Um, and in terms of the chats and all the comments, thank you for your support. Um, thank you, Ashad, for your kind words. And without further ado, uh, look us up at complyreg.com, visit FinTech Ireland. Uh, Many thanks from me and Stephen, I guess, many thanks from you. Yep. Thanks very much, everybody. Hope you uh, got value from the event. Thank you, everybody. A great to have a thanks. great afternoon.